This is the Jocko Underground Podcast. It's number 86. 86th the term. Mm-hmm. You, you you had that in the in the what the bar community? Yep. The nightclub night community. Yes, sir. That's Echo Charles talking on the other side. Did you ever get 86 from a bar? I have never been 86. I have never been kicked out of a bar. <laughs> I've never been anything. Yeah. No, I'm very I'm, I was always a very well behaved uh patron. Jack. All right. Well, that makes one of us. So <laughs> speaking of which, I got asked by a buddy of mine this weekend if I didn't get assigned to SEAL Team One when I graduated Buds, would I be different? And I just wrote back, he was texting me, and I wrote back, yes. So the basis of the question is, and you may have heard me talk about this, back in the day, otherwise known as back in the day, and it's not like this anymore. SEAL Team One used to be known as Stalag Team One. And the reason they called it that was because it was the most militant team on the West Coast anyways. It had uniform inspections, it had haircut inspections. It was kind of like the equivalent of SEAL Team 2 on the East Coast, which is the second team that I went to, and there's a reason why I wanted to go to SEAL Team 2 when I left SEAL Team 1. But he he knew me. This is this is a friend of mine that was also in the Navy, but it's someone that who I knew growing up. We knew we were childhood friends. Mm. So he understood the Navy, he understood the differences. He'd actually been to Coronado, understood, you know, the Navy, understood the, understood that the different teams had different cultures. Mm. And so he knew that uh, SEAL Team 1 was kind of regarded as like the strict of the SEAL teams. Mm. I remember so at some point he had, this was back in the 90s. Mm. Back in the 90s, he had like saw some picture and it was some SEAL and he had like a skateboard sticker on mm. his gear, right? Skull skates, by the way. I don't know if they're still around. But he was kind of like, well, that's kind of crazy. I go, yeah, it's not. They're not from SEAL Team 1. Yeah, I kind of was like, hey, bro, we're, we're not doing that over here. So this friend was asking me, do you think you'd be the same if you didn't go to SEAL Team 1? And the answer to me is no, which seems obvious, because I was young and impressionable, impressionable and malleable as a 19-year-old BUDS graduate checking in to Team 1. But I was also, and this is sort of just the kind of known factors of my life, is I was a rebellious kid. I have a rebellious streak. I've always had a rebellious streak. I have that psychological reactance, don't like to get told what to do. I've told the story about the fact that when I joined the Navy, my dad was like, you're going to hate it because you hate authority and you don't like listening to people. He's 100% right. Mm. He was 100% right. So I was a rebellious from birth, had that rebellious streak. I grew up, I was way into hardcore music, very rebellious attitude, the hardcore attitude. Listen to Cro Mags, listen to Bad Brains, listen to Agnostic Front. That's what I was doing. Anti social, anti societal. I was outside the realm. And so, what turns out, or well, the way it turned out, I think I actually got what I needed from SEAL Team One. I think that if I would have been at a team that had inherently a more rebellious attitude, I would have been totally out of control. Mm-mm. I would have taken that and be like, oh, that's what we're doing? <laughs> okay, I got it. So if I went to a team that would have been more laid back, I would have been like, oh, it's cool to have long hair, cool. Oh, it's cool to be a biker, cool. Oh, we're fighting everyone, like, okay, right on. And look, SEAL team, all the SEAL teams had some of that stuff going on. But when I went to team one, there was at least a, at that time, there was an underlying culture of military professionalism. Like an underlying culture, I mean, I, when we got there, we were going on our first run as new guys, and one of my buddies wore a visor. You know what a visor is? It's like a hat yeah. without a thing. Yeah, right? without the top. Yeah, without the top. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not part of military uniform. And the master chief, master chief of the command, so like the senior enlisted guy there, sees him, walks up to him, and says, like, if you ever wear a visor again at SEAL Team 1, I'm gonna have you sent to the fleet. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> I, I was like, God, 
like that was insane. Yeah. Like thinking about getting sent to the fleet after yeah. you graduated from Buds and checked into a team, and now you're getting sent to the fleet. Like this is insane. Yeah. And he's and he's a master chief, and he means it. He wasn't yeah. like trying to be hyperbolic. He was serious. Yeah. Like I will send you to the fleet if I ever see you wearing a visor again. Brutal. So military professionalism was held in high regard, and there's a chance that I could have like rebelled against that. Like this place sucks, but like no. Because I was, it's weird, I was rebellious, but I was also young and malleable. Like, mm. okay, that's that's what the Master Chief is saying. That's what we're doing. We're, yeah. we're wearing the right uniform. That's So I think it helped me. And this is what I was thinking about that after my buddy asked me this question. If I would have been the authoritarian type, it would have been better for me to go to a team that was a little bit more lax and a little bit more open-minded about things. Because essentially what I think happens is in the teams, the way it used to now look, the teams are all kind of the same now. They're very much more the same than they used to be. Mm. Not that they were all like totally different, but there's a definitely, you had a culture at each one of the teams. Mm -hmm. And now the teams are much more the same because people get switched more. Like you used to, like I, I spent freaking seven years at SEAL Team 1. Mm. Like seven years, bro. I mean, I got there and they just stayed there. And that was very common. There was a lot of guys. They were just team one guys. Mm. There was team five guys. There was team three guys mm. out on the East Coast. There was guys There was guys when I got to team two. There was guys that had been at SEAL team two for like 20 years, bro. They were in the game. Wait, they weren't going anywhere. Wait, so you can just, so it's more, you think it's more common to jump, not jump, but just. Nowadays, to you'll, do, you'll do like two tours at team one, two tours at team three, two tours at oh, team okay. five, or two tours at team eight. Then you'll go and you, you'll do like, you'll go to trading, trade at, then you go back to eight. And you won't be like, oh, like, dude, I'm not, I'm waiting to go to, to team one. Mm. No one's saying that. They're like, oh, I can get orders. I can do a platoon chief or I can do my LPO slot over at team two. Cool. I'll go. Mm. They're not like, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to go to this team. They don't really care as much as they used to. Again, the teams, there's still obviously tradition and history at the teams, yeah. but it's not as, there's not as much of the differenti differentiating culture as there used to be. But this is the thing that I think is cool, is if you, th if you, leaders that want to control everything, you will find out that you can't control everything. Mm. And that's a positive thing. The other end of the spectrum is leaders that want to pull the that don't want to pull the reins in and just kind of like oh I'm kind of laid back I'm just everyone's cool. Eventually you'll watch things get totally out of control. Mm -hmm. So depending on the type of leader that you are, it's good to go into the environment that's the opposite. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. if I would have been like a super crazy leader or a cra just a crazy guy. It was good, and I kind of was a little bit, right? I was kind of rebellious. I went to team one, it was very good for me. Mm -hmm. If I would have been like a like a very militant person mm -hmm. that was like, oh, I went to a military school, it probably would have been better for me to go to another team where it's like, hey, dude, you need to chill out. Mm -hmm. Like occasionally they would take guys and they'd send them officers, they'd send them to ranger school. And ranger school's totally militant, totally strict. And sometimes they would come out of that and it would enhance their militaristic attitude yeah. and you'd be like bro this ain't the rangers yeah, yeah. like you don't we're not doing that Understand. and some guys were so wild you'd have to send them to ranger school and it was good for them because they'd be like bro this is the military yeah you're not just able to do whatever you want so i got put into an environment as a rebellious cocky kid that kind of corrected that attitude and if i would have been a militaristic tyrant if I would have been a militaristic tyrant type of guy, mm -hmm. team one would have been good for me in the short term. Like, like I would have been like, heck yeah. And then I would have been the type of person that's like, hey, you need to get a haircut, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was never like that. I, even though I came from team one and even though like in Task Unit Bruiser's like, hey, we need to wear square to wear uniforms. I did it for the mission. I wasn't doing it for my own authority. You see what I'm saying? There's yeah. a huge difference. Yeah, fully. And like when we were on Camp Mark Lee, I didn't care what you wear. Yeah. I didn't care at all, I didn't care what uniform. I wasn't like, hey Leif, when you come into my office to talk to me, you better be in a freaking uniform. No, yeah. I was like, dude, you roll in with flip flops, surf shorts, shirt is optional, like we're in the team, bro, I don't care. Yeah. When we go out and talk to a battalion commander, be freaking squared away, that's the way it is. Yeah. But if someone has a militaristic, tyrannical attitude, it might be good for them in the short term because they fit in, mm -hmm. but in the long term, in the long term, it doesn't develop them as a person. Yeah. Well. 
So I had kind of an open mind and team one focused my mind a little bit, right? If I would have had a closed mind, it would have been better for me to go to a team where the atmosphere opened up my mind. And the reason that I'm saying all this, (laughs) this is a long way of me, uh, for me to get to this point, is that it's good to put yourself in environments that challenge you and your belief systems. Yeah. It's good to put yourself in that type of environment. Now, that being said, there is a, I just got lucky that I got sent to team one. Yeah. No one was like, let's do a personality assessment of Jocko. Oh, this guy listens to freaking hardcore and punk rock music and he's a wild kid and we, we need to give him some more military. They didn't say that, mm-hmm. they just randomly, I got team one. <laughs> Me and GIF going over Hell to team yeah. one. Yeah. Actually, a bunch of guys from my class went to team one. Yeah. Um, and a bunch of guys went to other teams as well. But what I'm saying is, you, so you don't necessarily get a chance to select your environment, mm-hmm. but pay attention to if you are comfortable if, in that environment. Because if you're comfortable in that environment, it may not be conducive to your own growth as a person. Mm-hmm. You may be, you know, it's like we're doing jujitsu, yeah. and there's like a class where they're doing a lot of takedowns. Mm -hmm. And you're like, dude, I love takedowns. I wrestled in high school, this is awesome. You're stoked, right? But once you get to the ground, hey, we're just gonna stand it back up. You're kind of stoked on that. So you go to that class more often. That's what I'm saying. What you need to do is you need to go get engaged in those classes where they're doing a lot of groundwork or vice versa. You're like, hey, dude, I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. I'm not a wrestler. Well, okay, you still need to get some takedowns on. So. you can't just conform and accept what feels good. Mm. You need to push back on yourself. You need to feel some resistance in the world. And if you can't, if you don't feel any resistance in, in the atmosphere that you're at, that you're in, then you need to check it and make sure you develop some resistance and you think about things from an outside perspective that you detach so that you can use that resistance. You might have to create some resistance, like, hey man, look, I, I know I could just skip the warm up and skip the takedown part of this class, mm-hmm. but that's not the right thing to do. Yeah. I can do it, right. but it's not the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm gonna get in there. I'm gonna make it happen. I mean, that's what we wanna do. We use that resistance to get better because we don't improve if we are staying in an environment that's not forcing us to reassess where we're at. Kind of a long way for me to say that, but yeah. does that make sense? Oh yeah, fully. So you know how, and I guess the, the what's the idea, right? The saying, there's no growth in the comfort zone, <laughs> but yeah. the, you're, it was interesting. I never really thought about this n- until right now, like this very specific thing. It might've mm-hmm. been, came to my mind before, but not really think about it, where you're talking about from a physical perspective, like physically placing yourself in an environment or being in an environment that challenges you outside of your comfort zone like even like a day-to-day or just like Mm -hmm. just in life you see i'm saying you ever watched the movie american history x yes good that was a solid one so so remember right where uh what was this what was his name started with a d right was it darren or i don't know the main character ed Ed norton ed norton yeah so he goes he goes to jail yeah um and he's a white supremacist dude he goes to jail and he does not like black people at all D- dislikes on obviously white supremacy. You, <laughs> He's know. A white you, supremacy. you know the gig. All right, so he goes and he gets paired up in the laundry room, right, with a black guy. Yep. And this black guy's like, kind of on the surface, like real stereotypical. He's talking a lot. He's doing all this stuff, and he's like, he doesn't like him. He won't even say one word to him. But he has to work in that environment. Got to work with him. So over time, because the guy's talking, he's making jokes, all this stuff. Over time, he kind of like essentially in a nutshell. Slowly opens his mind. Slowly opens his mind. Maybe these black people aren't as bad as I thought kind of a thing. This he's, you know, this one right here, he's making jokes, we're actually, and they become friends. And his mind slowly gets open, he gets to stretch like that, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? But physically being in that environment, you're right, man, mm-hmm. you're right. It's funny, like with, I used to go um, to competition training with Dean Lister at other schools. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the same gig, yep. where you know, when you're a stranger, in a oh yeah, they're gonna bring that heat. Bro. Oh, they're bringing that heat. If you're a teammate, if target you're target practice, like you're a yeah. target, you might oh, as well yeah. just be a grappling dummy. Yeah, and there's more stuff on the line too. So, like, think about it. In your mm-hmm. back in our competition days, mm-hmm. you come to the main spot. You come to victory for competition training. You know the guy, I'm Jocko, Andy, mm-hmm. all these guys. I know these guys. You know, so there's no, 
there's an element of comfort in that, mm-hmm. no matter how hard the training is. But you go to the if you're a stranger in another, you know, academy and they're doing competition training, that level of comfort is mm-hmm. gone. Straight up gone. Yep. But you get used to it and you can actually feel it when you go back home to victory. You're kinda of like, Oh, this is like real kind of cruise. It's easier to be mm-hmm. honest with you. And it's more from a mental standpoint. Right. It's right. easier. Unless you're a foreigner coming into victory and then you're like, Oh, these guys are out to get Oh right, which is the same gig, just flipped yep, around. Just yeah, flipped exactly around. right. So yeah, you apply that kinda of in life where yeah, put yourself in those physical mm-hmm. Physically put yourself in those. The, the weird thing, too, is, and we covered this on the psychology of military incompetence, but a lot of times people that are attracted to. That is a little excerpt of what we are doing on the Jocko Underground podcast. So if you want to continue to listen, go to jockounderground.com and subscribe. And we're doing this to mitigate our reliance on external platforms so we are not subject to their control. And we're doing it so we can give you more control, more interaction, more direct connections, better communications with us, strengthen this legion of troopers that are in the game with us. So thank you, it's jockounderground.com. It costs eight dollars and 18 cents a month and if you can't afford to support us we can still support you just email assistance at jockounderground.com and we'll get you taken care of until then we will see you mobilized underground